Okay, we are live. Uh, happy Memorial Day, everybody. If you're joining us live, thank you for watching slash listening on a holiday of sorts. Um, if, if not, if you're listening to us later as a podcast, thank you for listening again. Uh, welcome to Sagas and Sass Season 2. I'm Tara, along with fellow hosts Jonathan and Nami. This episode will cover uh, Throne of Jade, book two of the Temeraire series by Naomi Novik. If you're watching live, join us in the chat or after the fact, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Sagas and Sass to continue the conversation. And just a reminder, the views expressed in this show are those of the hosts as individuals and do not necessarily represent the show as a whole. And now I have the honor of starting the summary for you guys on this fantastic <laughs> holiday. So, well, his majesty's dragon may have left us thinking all's well that ends well for a hot minute. But don't you worry, there are nine books in this series and we're only on book two. So Throne of Jade kicks off with a bunch of envoys from China showing up in England to demand that they return Temerer, because not only was he meant for Napoleon, an emperor, but Lawrence is a dirty commoner and not worthy of a celestial dragon. Not surprisingly, neither Lawrence or Temerer takes this very well. So after a lot of threats back and forth, and the British government being basically useless and ridiculous the whole time, they all agree that Temeraire and his flight crew, Lawrence included, should all accompany the envoys back to China. Of course, land routes are impassable at the moment because everyone either hates the British or has already bowed to Napoleon, by force or otherwise. So they have to go on a super long sailing trip, which would have been a lot for the flight crew to deal with, even if they weren't constantly at odds with the sailors and the Imperial convoys. And for the sake of um, practicality, they're basically sailing all the way around Africa right now mm -hmm. because the Suez Canal doesn't exist. Although, <laughs> if you really want to think about it, you could just imagine that container ship is still there blocking it up. <laughs> <laughs> the Chinese group warms up to Lawrence just a bit when they find out he's related, albeit very distantly, to the King of England. But that's about as good as it gets. And it doesn't help that Lawrence is at odds with both Captain Riley, who we thought was his friend, but apparently he supports the slave trade, and Lawrence, thank gosh, bless him, does not. And he also sort of doesn't really get along with the new British diplomat to China, Arthur Hammond. Unfortunately, those two dudes are the least of Lawrence's worries. First, Temerere catches a cold and is only cured when the Chinese delegation's cooks give him a pasta made from a gross ass mushroom. Then at some point they battle a sea monster, Temerer has to kill it and he's well, really upset about that. And when they actually get to China, well, let's just say it's really freaking clear that Chinese dragons have far superior lifestyles to those of European dragons. Instead of living in clearings in the woods and eating raw whole animals, they have special homes built just for them, chefs to cook their food just the way they like it. They're actually educated. And they can even buy and sell things. Now China isn't perfect, there's this whole thing with an albino dragon that one of the princes chose as his companion because everyone else insisted she was essentially cursed. And the fact that while the non-imperial or celestial dragons do have jobs, there's not much put in place for the aging dragons who can't work any longer, which Lauren sees evidence of when he watches an older dragon purchase a pretty awful looking dinner from a street vendor of sorts. But for Temeraire, everything is going swimmingly. He gets to meet his entire family, including his mother, and he hooks up with an imperial dragon named Mei. Ew. He's basically <laughs> living his best life, even while a certain Chinese prince is trying to trick him into bonding with a young royal who he's trying to get onto the Chinese throne. Thankfully, no one is really falling for this, and although Temeraire definitely likes a lot of things about China, like the very good boy he is, he is, he still refuses to be parted from Lawrence. Instead, he decides he wants to bring some of the Chinese ways to the dragons of Britain, but that's going to be another story for another time because before they can even think about leaving China, several things happen. One, Lawrence and his men are attacked in their quarters and a surprisingly lengthy battle occurs. Two, the Chinese prince tries to put his coup plans into motion at a theater production of all things, but Temeraire sort of accidentally kills him. And three, Lawrence is adopted as an honorary son by the emperor so that he can continue being Temeraire's companion. So all's well that ends well, again, I guess, especially as Temeraire chooses Lawrence and therefore Britain over China. Though there is a pesky little situation regarding the dead prince's dragon, that albino one uh, who no one else will have and who is now probably okay, almost definitely out for revenge. But then that is yet another tale 
for another time. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So, uh, I mean, I know like on, on our first term or webcast, I, I kept saying, cause I had written, you know, read, I had read, written, God, I'm tired. I had read ahead, read ahead, <laughs> uh, through book three of the series. And I very much, I enjoyed this one, uh, despite the first half, like their sea voyage being super slow. I did enjoy this one a lot more than the first book. So like, how did you guys feel about it? Better, worse, about the same? It, infinitely better. I was also kind of meh about the sea journey, but I did like the like political drama and like the conflicts between like the sailors and the aviators that was going on there. Mm -hmm. Um, I also just loved them being in China in general and the fact that it wasn't a look at these Asian savages sort of narrative, which you normally expect from white authors writing something of this time period. Instead, it was very, like, very actually good, like, you know, addressing, like, what was actually happening there while also being like, hey, they're haughty as fuck, <laughs> you know, which they were. And so I enjoyed all of that. I enjoyed, like, you know, meeting Temeraire's family, like, seeing that he had the family and, like, the intrigue of, like, trying to figure out the plot there. Actually, I rated this book four out of five stars on Goodreads, whereas I rated the uh, the, the first book a three star. And like, mm. like I said, if it was, if, if I had read this book first, I would have been like, heck yeah, this series versus my, eh, this series, I guess. Yeah. Well, I thought the plot line was better in this one, but I thought in some ways that there were even fewer interesting characters to care about. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it doesn't help that, like, we didn't get to see anything of uh, Harcourt or Jane Rowland or, um, oh, my gosh, what's, oh, my gosh. Ma uh, Ma well, even the other Ma captain who who has Berkeley. the, uh, what's Berkeley. the name? Berkeley, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's the one. I was struggling for that one, too. Yeah, like we didn't get to see the gang back together, which was a bit sad. And also, I... Is it weird that like Emily Rowland kind of made this book for me? Cause like every time she was on screen, I was like, yeah, Emily, go yeah. Emily. Well, and uh, honestly, like, you know, one of the things I think when I was about halfway through this book, basically before they got to China and, and like, cause the sea voyage really like, I, it just really didn't do it for me. Um, and, and that's kind of the theme, like a thing I've seen in a lot of reviews and stuff as I've kind of done a little bit of research, um, you know, for this, this particular episode of our webcast, like, uh, that, that everybody thinks the first half just drags. Like it starts like it, the beginning of the book kind of kicks off with like two battles pretty much. And it's like real quick, quick. And then all of a sudden for, I don't know, a couple hundred pages or something, they're just on the ocean. And like the big issue is like, Tamir has a cold. Like, like, about the ocean oh, they also got attacked by a sea monster. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, that, was... that happened so much later. Like, that's at the end of the sea voyage. Yeah. And it was, like, there was, like, 300 pages in between there, or what it felt like 300 pages of... Well, don't, don't forget the uncomfortable dinner. And... Yeah. Oh, no. Gosh forbid the uncomfortable <laughs> dinner. And, and, the, and the outing of Emily, which was much ado about nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I didn't quite get that whole. They were also, quote, nervous about it. Then Riley makes a big deal of it. It's like, oh, yeah, of course we need them to, for the dragons that won't take a man as as their captain. And then nothing came of it. So it was a total moot point. Yeah, like they clearly weren't happy about it. But yeah, th there was no big discussion about it. Like there was no like, oh, we can't have a woman on board our ship. There, It was very, it was like brushed off, brushed away. The worst thing for me about like that long journey was that all it made me do was hate Riley. Because mm -hmm. granted, I don't, again, I'm very apathetic to Lawrence, but like that's his friend. And like dude was like straight up like i'm gonna side with my sailors over you even though my sailors are obviously being jackasses here like every single time and i was like dude this doesn't help and then it comes out that he's pro-slavery and i'm like just go do drown in the ocean riley like bye go away i don't like riley like not just pro-slavery but like his family is like part of the slave trade yeah well i mean yeah. is he is he really pro-slavery or is he basically one of those I, I'm not strong enough to to stand up to my family. That's I, still pro-slavery. 
Yeah, I, I, I think I think at best, and I'm using that v term very loosely, he is apathetic about it. Like I don't think yeah, he's that's against, how I, I interpret it. I don't think he's against it though. Like and and that's not just because he doesn't fight against his family. I really think he just is kind of like, yeah, whatever. This is the way this is the way things are. You know what I mean? Like there's 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 like the level of like he's like all for it. And then at the bottom, there's a level of like, he's totally against it, but still isn't doing anything about it, which is still pro-slavery. And he's somewhere in the middle where he's not necessarily super all for it. He's definitely not all against it. He's just like apathetic about it. Like it's the way things are. So, you know, and, yeah. and listen, like, of course there's going to be like, there's going to be characters like for this to have any sort of like actual historical basis, there are going to be characters who are pro slavery. I understand that. It just but, sucks that it has to be yeah, somebody no, I, that, regardless of that, I'm just not going to like them. Whoever, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Out that Jane Roland is pro slavery. Like, I'm sorry, Jane, you're, you're a garbage can now. Or rather, if it comes out that any character is not staunchly anti slavery, doesn't matter if it's a historical book. I hate them now. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I'm not. That's what I'm saying. Like, that's kind of what sucks about it. Cause like, I want, like, I didn't want to dislike Riley. Like he, we were given a good picture of him in the first book really. And then in this book, it's like, oh, well, uh, sorry, not sorry. First book, Riley was a good bean. And then this book, Riley was just like, ah, do you see? No, well, no, he was exactly the same. You just didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but well, I mean, yeah, yeah, because we didn't see him being captain of the ship and like this, you know, his soldier or his sailors being at odds, obviously, with with like the aviators and stuff. I mean, and this is it's definitely, you know, I, I, I'm i not saying this sea voyage was pointless because, I, you know, obviously it did. Um, it, it gave us the it gave us the knowledge that Lawrence is anti Lawrence and his entire family are anti slavery. Well, specifically, um, he, he he gets it from his father, who's an abolitionist. Right, exactly. So, like, it gave us that knowledge about like Lawrence Lawrence's character as well as like his family as a whole. Um, and and you know, we just got to see a little bit more of the whole like you know aviators versus the rest of the British soldiers, sort of um, you know plot point that's i think probably gonna continue for quite a while if not throughout the whole series uh so it, it and the sea monster thing was um it was a cool like little vignette on its own but like nami said it's just like there was so much like exposition you know while they were on this sea voyage it just it just it was so long and then it felt like the second half of the book when they were in China, or maybe it was a little less than half, it just, they the jam packed everything else into, you know, the second half. Well, whereas the first half just sort of, after the two like quick battles just really crawled. Um, I don't know. I just feel like they didn't really, they, they really could have glossed over a lot more of that sea voyage than they did. <laughs> In a way, I think it was like an effective plot device of making it be like, this is a long ass voyage. It's a boring ass voyage because that's yeah. what it was. And I think, you know, like narratively, the pacing did feel off to us. But in a sense, the pacing of their story was off because it was literally them on a boat for like a year. And then they get off the boat and like, wham, bam, bam, China, dragon capitalism, plots, assassinations, tiny prince, dragon thief. <laughs> Your mother, dragon sex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, like in a way, it does like narratively make sense why it was so slow. But just because it makes sense doesn't mean I had to like it. And I was, I was heck bored, as I'm sure Temeraire was. Poor, poor Temeraire. I can't imagine how he must have dealt with that. All I can think about now is that poor dragon sitting on this boat this whole time, being bored out of his hecking mind and just wanting to start a revolution. Yeah. Like poor buddy. Well, he, no, he didn't want to start a revolution yet. It was on the yeah, way, not quite on yeah, the way not. back. That he wants to start oh, the revolution. Yes, my bad. Temeraire is <laughs> always, always. He's got, he's got, got like a cold, and he can't fly. You know, yeah. or or even swim, and then there. I mean, there's also that whole like, well, we, you know, we don't want him like taking off or like jumping into the water and trying to climb back up on the boat because it upsets things. It was, it was all very like, uh, yeah, poor Temer. Like, I he just is legit just stuck there. 
I did like an image of like Temer, like when they were doing like the climbing back onto the boat scene. I had an image of him putting too much pressure on like one four leg and just yeeting the fl- <laughs> like like flipping it. Like <laughs> it was just it was really interesting to me. I thought Prince Prince Yangxing should have gotten flipped. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, the thing is, like, there were some characters in that that group of you know Chinese envoys. That, what was the one guy? Um... Sun Kai. Yeah, the one that was like yeah. seasick at the beginning, the big. Uh, no, that big... was. Uh... <sighs> See, the name that I'm thinking of is not from this. I know this because it is specifically from um, a, uh, a, a a Chinese story. The the name I'm thinking of, by the way, is Luo Binghei, but that's not the name. It's but it's like very close. Yeah, and and I, I mean, it, for me, it, for my part, I I don't remember just because I literally read this like two and a half months ago, probably. I don't so remember I, because I was listening to a white man narrate Chinese names. Ugh. Yeah, they, but the only like, and, and even like in looking, kind of looking through uh, like reviews and stuff, nobody really named. Oh, uh, Liu Liu Bao. Is Lu that, Bao. Lu Bao. Okay, here we go. Yeah, here I just I, I was gonna say I finally found it. Sun Kai is one. Liu Bao is the other. Um. So yeah, that's that's uh, yeah. The, the, Lu Bao was 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 fun. Uh, oh, some kind of being like a sneaky sneak the whole time and just being like, yeah. By the way, I speak English, bitches. <laughs> it was just so amusing to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I, I kind of I, honestly though, I kind of figured that out like pretty early well, I, on. I think like that some of them had to speak English because yeah. like, come on, guys. Like they're straight up ambassadors. Like they're not just gonna send idiots yeah the language to the country like that would be dumb well not even just idiots but just they're not going to send an entire group of envoys to an english-speaking country and only like only the translator can speak english can't <laughs> that's, that's that's like a doom but yeah no i that... although speaking of speaking other languages i do like how lawrence like is kind of like at the end like when he's in china he's like really trying to kind of learn like some of the language that was like okay lawrence you're wearing on you're wearing me down here dude well, well he already speaks multiple languages right yeah but not chinese but he but because of temporary he wants to learn it you know which is you know, it, it, he he's and chinese is not an easy language to learn either you know especially for somebody who only speaks English and like romance languages or like Germanic languages. Please. Chinese isn't even easy for somebody who speaks Indian languages. Like those pronunciations, it is Chinese. So like specifically Mandarin is what I've tried. So Mandarin and German are the two languages that I can't like wrap my tongue around. Like the noises Mm. that you need to be able to make to make the words are just they don't work for for German. It's the really like guttural stuff. I can't do that for the for for Chinese. There's just some like really they do these like twisty things that I just can't do it. Can't do it. I recently became obsessed with uh, the Untamed, which is why I know this because I tried to fangirl with my friend about it, and I was like, oh, I love this character. Wait, no, this character. No, th- this. I just tried to say his name. Like, what, what's the Untamed? It's very gay. <laughs> I've never heard of it either. Uh, it's on Netflix. It's very fun, and it's like oh, it's a show. Okay, okay. It's a show. Um, it's also it's a show based off of a book. So, okay. but the two main characters are husbands. Okay. Cannot. Well, it's not going to scare me away. So. <laughs> no, it wouldn't um, scare me away either. No, the the show is supposed to not be gay because of Chinese censorship laws, but even then, the show is so gay. <laughs> <laughs> which is kind of amazing but yeah no, it's basically like those like um it's like a wuxia genre so like chinese magic cultivation type okay. of affair it's very confusing so i kind of watched the first like half with the wiki up to be able to keep up with names but then once i figured it out i was like and now i would die for them so there's like the first few episodes where you're like i don't know what's happening then there's like the middle few episodes where you're like all right cool and then something clicks in your head and you're like and i love them all and now i'm obsessed uh well i also have to that and check it out um but uh, so anyway like just to kind of like wrap up like sea voyage discussion probably uh you know other than lawrence being anti-slavery um uh, the assassination attempt like that had me face palming so hard like, like literally like the first time it happened with the guy knocks him down the steps i was like dude that guy that you just that guy just tried to assassinate you. Like, why are yeah. you violently? Like, sir? 
And like the thing is that like I understand like the diplomat just being like, heck no, we can't make a fuss about this. Like I don't like it, but I get that reaction. But Laura's just being like, ah oh, yes, I am clumsy. Oh yeah. yeah, I was drunk. I'm just yeah. like, dude, do you not get it? Yeah, seriously. It's like like it's one thing to not want to make a stink about it because you know, for for like relation reasons between them and and the Chinese, but like it's a whole, it's an entirely different thing for like you said for Lawrence to go from like that might have been an assassination attempt to like nah, I'm just a drunk <laughs> and a fool. I think it said a, he said a, he was a drunkard and a fool. Like, I mean, you're kind of dumb a lot of the time, Lawrence, but no, you did almost get like this guy was clearly trying to kill you and then it comes back to bite him again later like i think this was one of those moments where i just sort of looked at lawrence and i was like what what and like and like the best part is like he's he's not even a drunkard or a fool like like he's super super boring but like his yeah. didn't even make sense i was like buddy but you're not like you're vaguely intelligent and you you don't drink like that so uh what's up with that bud Talk about gaslighting yourself. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Um, but yeah, so, so like, yeah, the assassination attempt stuff was a little bit maddening. Um, and then the other thing that really stood out to me was um, the conversation between Lawrence and Tamara about how dragons don't have their own money or really even have possessions. Um, particularly when Tamara said, it's not fair that we should be restricted by others' fears when we haven't done anything wrong. Uh, and I was like, yeah. wow, this is some like, I, I mean, th this book was written, the first one was published in 2006. So I don't know off the top of my head when this one was published, but I'm going to guess 2008 maybe and maybe 2007 even but like that 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 line like really stood out to me in terms of like everything that that just is kind of everything that's been coming up in in news the past couple of years about you know systemic like racism and keeping people down you know like not because they actually have done anything you know to deserve it but just because like we want to keep this like group under our control uh, and I'm using the word R because I am white. <laughs> Cream. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, yeah, that that line like really struck me. Like, just like the weapon is the weaponizing of fear towards like other groups, and like how poignant that line is in terms of that, and like you know, like the weaponization of like fear towards minorities in the u.s is like oh don't even want to touch that with a ten thousand foot pole because i could i could go off but yeah, like, same. like with how relevant that line is and like how on point naomi novik is at like sh putting in these little like political things in between like with temerair as a vessel because and it's like it's very effective and it's very good because i i love my son and he is very smart and he is doing his <laughs> best to try to make his father into a revolutionary like himself and i think his father is like very slowly coming around yeah and and like i also just um it and i know like lawrence it, i think it's i'm hoping it's in this book and i'm not like moving forward but it doesn't really matter it's kind of the same conversation like we know that people in england particularly or in britain are scared of dragons and we don't really know all that much about the history of like feral ones and what they might have done you know to like actually to people or to their you know livelihoods if they were attacking like livestock and stuff but the fact of the matter is that they have had the feral like they've had feral dragons basically under control they're all in like a breeding ground and the ones that aren't feral the ones that are trained or you know, have been trained and, and work with the aviators like they're intelligent beings i mean maybe with the exception of volley but like you're and, and dragons like him but even volley he knows right from wrong like you know he's not gonna go attack a person or attack like livestock you know like he knows what is what he is allowed to eat and stuff like that. I, I believe I, I don't at the very least because, you know, um, I can't remember his writer's name, but like he, James. you know, his, James, he, he, you know, he, he has told him, you know, no, that's wrong. And, and I feel like that at least is going to stick with Bali and the ones that are more 
uh, you know, intelligent Lily and Maximus and Temeraire and, and, you know, the, the actual fighting dragons, you know, they, like, it, there's, there's really no reason, assuming that it's been a long time since, um, you know, since there's been feral dragons attacking people, there's really no reason why the people of Britain couldn't have been like why they couldn't have gone on essentially like a paparazzi tour like you know showing people that dragons are like good like that they're helping the country in the wars and that they're also smart and aren't going to attack and kill them but nobody's even tried to do that they're they, they're kept so secretive you know well, you know it's once again like that whole status quo thing you know it's like mm -hmm they're not going to change it because they don't see anything wrong because that's what they've been raised to think is oh, right. Sure. Which is bullshit. Bullshit. Which is why I'm really super hoping the rest of this series is Temer going back home and be like, hey, free the dragons. Dragon capitalism. Let's go. Well, I think so. I said that during the first book, I, I was hoping it, it was even going to go further than that and take over. <laughs> I like Temer to rule the world. I feel like he'd be yeah, Well, Prime Minister. Temer. Yes. Oh my gosh. Prime Minister. Prime Minister Temeraire! That would be so cute! <laughs> <laughs> it's too bad he couldn't go to the United States and become president because he wasn't born there or born here. Oh, but it's okay. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, anything else about the uh, sea voyage before we go into the real fun parts, aka China? <laughs> Were you good? Okay. No, I, right. no, I thought the Temer feeling really terrible about killing the sea monster was interesting. Yes. Uh, yeah, that that was um it was important. Like I I mean I think it like really highlights his compassion in a sense. Yeah. Like he really he's the it's like he very much has like a rehabilitation mindset. It's like it doesn't if a creature is capable of learning, they should be given the chance to learn and to do better, even if they've done terrible things, which is very much against what Lawrence is doing, which, which what Lawrence is thinking, which is that if a creature is capable of learning, it would have already learned and therefore it wouldn't do terrible things, which is a very different mindset to think about. And Temeraire, like having compassion for the sea creature, despite it having already killed people and being like, no, it doesn't need to die. We can teach it was like, really it, it it served like doubly to highlight how you know willing he is to like help people and creatures learn but also how naive he is in a sense mm. it was it was very well good. i mean that's sort of i mean it, 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 to be honest in in that way he is very much like the child who uh you know doesn't understand why uh i don't know like 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 why their friend is is you know that, that goes to school with them can't afford lunch or whatever you know what i mean like uh, it, obviously a different like situation but it's it, you know he's he's a child in that sense still like he's a very intelligent being but he has not seen enough of the world and to be honest i'm not like i, I think it's going to take a lot to get him to the like to get him i i hope he doesn't become jaded Ha ha ha! Throne of Jade, jaded. Um, <laughs> like I don't want him to become jaded, uh, you know. So I'm just hoping that. But I also don't want Lawrence to like gloss things over too much because I feel like if he's not careful, that will drive you know a wall between the two of them. Um, but yeah, but yeah, the, him 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 being you know upset about killing the sea monster was I think. I think it was I, I I it didn't really come up again in this book, but I uh and, and and I mean I have read one beyond this, but I can at the very least say like I I I'm gonna guess and I when I say that I do truly mean I'm going to guess that it's go something like that is going to come up again, whether it's be, you know, Temeraire saying like, well, no, we can we can teach these feral dragons to like live in society again or something like that. Like I I I, I think that there's a possible, a very strong possibility that this is one of those themes that's going to come back. Um, so, okay, then we get to China. Uh, there's just so much, like the fact that just the treatment of dragons there versus elsewhere. Like we know for sure what it's like in Britain, and I think you know it seems pretty clear that it's the same way in France. You know, 
in terms of how dragons live and everything. Um, you know, but in China, the, the fact they, they can earn money, they can purchase things. They, they don't own land or property, but like what they have, like what they're given in terms of like places to stay and stuff is, you know, way nicer than in Britain. They're taught to, well, certain dragons are taught to read and write. I'm sure not all of them. Um, you know, but then of course there's the older dragon that we mentioned in the summary who was too old to work and you're, or, or age to the point where he can't earn a, enough money and he's like basically living in poverty. Um, you know, the only ones, the only breeds that they see that seem to be just cosseted for their entire lives are the Imperials and the Celestials. Uh, but I did like, I did like those little like horse sized dragons, the little messenger dragons. Oh my God. I want one. <laughs> Like, I kind of want one of those more than I want, like, a Temeraire, honestly. They're Temeraire so would eat too much, and I don't have the stomach to prepare meats for him. So yeah. um, I would have to do with the tiny dragon, but a tiny dragon would be fun. But, uh, yeah, no, um, I really, I loved everything about how, like, the dragons had so much freedom. But at the same time, I was like, oh, why do they make dragons just to put them in capitalism? Yeah. <laughs> Which is also, I mean, a bit... <sighs> I guess I, to be honest, I don't know that much about the Chinese, like the pre-communist Chinese. Oh, no, I have um, no economy. idea what it was actually. I have no idea what it is supposed to be, historically speaking, but it looked like capitalism and it smelled like capitalism. So I think it is capitalism. Oh, the, the drag, the dragons, the dragons were definitely living in like, se like, a, like some semblance of capitalism for yeah, sure. Yeah, I was like, 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 I was like, heck yeah, freedom for dragons. But then I was also like, oh no, please, please don't go hungry. So... So I guess I, in conclusion, China dragon plan for all dragons, but also dragon welfare. They need Medicare and social security. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> but not the one that we have because ours sucks. So <laughs> what, whatever, what is it? Well, social is it? security actually works fairly well. It's Medicare well, that, and for, Medicaid for, that for is. People, for and, people who are and getting quite honestly, Medicare and Medicaid work better than our other, the rest of our healthcare system. So, yeah, and like Social Security might work for y'all, but uh, I yeah, it, it's not going to work for me. <laughs> <laughs> it may or may not. That's but oh, that's not because there's of no the may or may not about it. The flaw I'm not, there's none for me. Absolutely, yeah. no, uh, rip. But uh, but I yeah, they 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 need. But it's also interesting because like I feel like. We've always, the fact that they don't take care of the aging dragons who've been working was like a little bit upsetting. Cause like you said, it's very much like too capitalistic. And I feel like, uh, I feel like in like Asian I, I countries, I, like, I've always been taught that in Asian countries, they take care of those who are too old to care for themselves. Like, no, no, in Asian countries, the family takes care of the people who are too old for themselves. In right. fact, the youngest well, child I mean, the is basically supposed to take care of the parents. So if you don't have children, you're screwed. Yeah. Right. But in but dragon like, society, why are those young dragons taking care of them? But like, see, I think my whole thing with this was that I'm hoping it'll sort of be a like way for Lawrence to examine classism within human society. Because, mm. you know, in a way, I don't think Lawrence, it occurs to him much how sad poverty can be until he sees how sad poverty is in a dragon. Mm. And I'm hoping that it can be a further parallel to Lawrence growing as a person and realizing, you know what, my situation is not like these aviators because when I retire, I have my family's money to end up to go back on. I have my like stipend from like getting Temer's egg. And like most of those aviators, they don't come from money. They're probably just like normal poor families. And like, I hope that that can be a thing that the series grows into just because I'm having faith in Naomi Novik for while I'm not interested in these characters except for Tamarare, I am interested in the topics that these characters are exploring and the theme yeah. they're sussing out with Tamarare going, but this doesn't make sense, it's mean. And I'm like, yes, buddy, you're right. It is mean. Good dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I like. I actually, I was about to say something, and then I had to catch myself because I'm pretty sure what I was about to say is actually from the third book. Uh, so I'm just gonna like, I, 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 there's, there's a character that we learn more about, I believe, in the third book that uh, they do start exploring some of those themes of, of like poverty in, and not just poverty, but just 
the the classism of like people who inherit dragons versus people who uh you know become aviators and are kind of just they might be lucky and get to be part of a really good flight crew or they might be really lucky and get an egg of their own so um because we all you know, like we know that like like Emily Rowland like we know she's going to get a dragon because mm -hmm. her mom eventually is not going to be around and she's going to inherit her dragon uh, and even if she doesn't, I feel like, you know, there's so few women in the aviators that even if something were to happen where, you know, the, her, her, her mother's dragon somehow does not outlive Jane, um, what is this? Exidium? Exidium, right? Exidium, yeah. Like if, if Exidium doesn't outlive Jane, then there's so few women that they've trained up as aviators that she'll get a long wing. You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's, it's, it seems statistically likely that if something happens, that means that she wouldn't get Exidium, that she would probably get Lily just because she's been, you know, raised in the same place as Harcourt and like presumably trained together. Cause they also mentioned that Harcourt was like, no, no, Lawrence is supposed to father Harcourt's, uh, child and um oh yeah that but also, that, that was roland's whole idea of, but it also doesn't yeah. seem like he's gonna do that because he's like with Lor Lor roland now and i think while lawrence could get into the idea of premarital sex i don't think he can get into the idea of just actively being a sperm donor <laughs> well that and like i feel like Catherine harcourt is he looks he's at her as more of like a younger sister or something i don't yeah, think she's that, young you know. right she's like you know he I, very much has like every single time he's talked about her, he he like at first he was like, ah yes, this young boy. Oh God, this young girl. Yeah. <laughs> and and I I think that uh their age difference might not be a huge amount, especially for the time period. But I, yeah, I was guessing about 10 years. Yeah, I, I think she's in her early twenties. Yeah, actually, but, like I had pegged hardcore as 20 and Lawrence as like 27, 28. 30 well, I, I I thought he was older. I thought he was like mid to late thirties, but he's uh, younger than we think. No, but, in the, that era, the the captains of those types of ships tended to be in their late twenties to early thirties. Yeah, I I think I just the way he is so boring made me think he was. Ah, <laughs> uh, then you have clearly not talked to men in their twenties because I can assure you, Tara, they are. Dull. Oh, I have. I just don't. <laughs> I never paid much attention to anything they had to say. <laughs> I thought you thought they were less dull. Um, <laughs> so but, uh, <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 I guess I just, I just assumed that he was kind of dull because he'd been like a leader for a while and was kind of like he'd just been doing this for a bit and was just boring. But, uh, but yeah, I, I'm. Oh, so one of the things, just kind of going back a little bit to the idea of like inheriting dragons and stuff. Uh, Yang Xing, like um, him, him choosing. Uh, oh God, what is her name? Uh, His dragon's name. Uh, like him choosing the albino dragon, and I feel really bad that I'm not remembering her name. Uh, hold up, wait, I can Google this really quickly. But, like, him, him choosing this dragon that, like, no one else would have, and the fact that he, uh, you know, by in doing so, he, like, gives up his claim to, like, the throne or whatever, right? Yeah, like I really liked him for Lien. I know! Lien, yeah. For, like, a minute, it's like, oh, he's a good guy. Oh, well, okay, not. I would like to clarify. There was never he's a good guy. It was always he's an asshole with a heart of gold. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there you go. You know, I never I never actually liked him, but I was like, okay, he's got a redeeming quality, especially because Leanne shows up and she like very clearly does love him. And like the whole like, you know, like her introduction is basically her being like, guys, I'm tired and I can't see at night, but I'm a yeet myself. I, and sorry, I, guys, I'm tired and the light hurts my eyes, but I'm yeeting myself across China in broad daylight because I miss my boy. And like, that was just like really cute and wholesome. And like, the fact that so um the specific reason that Lian is considered unlucky is because white is a white is like the morning colors in China and it's also like morning colors in a lot of like Asian countries. And so like so she's like very like she seems like a bad omen because of that, because she's albino and it's just so sad because she seems lovely. And I except now she's like revenge driven, which also like not great. Like sweetie, your your man's was like he was not good. He was he was trying to murder people, like your cousin, your cousin's BFF. Well, you assume the, you assume you assume she wasn't in on it. 
Yeah, no, I suspect she was probably in on it too, which is the sad part because like, I really, like that moment made me, it, like I was like literally texting Tara while I was reading it because Jonathan, I didn't know if he would finish the book yet. So I wasn't going to spoil it for you. But I was literally texting Tara and I'm like, I can't believe I thought Yangsheng could have possibly been not the worst because of because of Leanne, but turns out they're both the worst. And now I'm just sad. <laughs> but yeah, also, yeah. I think the funniest thing, like, relating to all of that, though, was, like, the fact that, like, Emily Rowland and, like, what's his name, like, Dwyer or, like, whatever, the other little kid were, like, the ones that, like, unravel the plot because they're like, hey, look, it's Prince Mian guy. Hi! <laughs> and they all became buddy-buddy with him and it was like, oh! And oh. I like how the prince was just like, oh, shit, hi, friends! <laughs> <laughs> that tickled me a lot because the whole time well the other thing is did the young prince have anything to do with it no the little boy i don't think he did because you also see specifically at the very end like they they basically say how his innocent testimony basically like seals yangsheng's casket because he's like yeah my uncle asked me if i wanted to be emperor and if i wanted a dragon and i was like yeah i like that and i'm like yeah buddy of course you like that (laughs) who knows he could be super super like he could be the big bad in like seven books when he's grown but as yeah, I, for, for now, I think he really was just an innocent little kid who was like, this is a cool ass dragon, man. Like, and, and like my uncle is telling me that I can have this dragon probably like, I, I mean, I, yeah, he, he was definitely just a little kid. Like, it's like going to your nephew and being like, hey, kid, you want this prize winning pony? You want a pony? Kid? It doesn't matter that it belongs to somebody else. It's going to be yours if you ride it. Like, you know, like. <laughs> I think, oh man, um, what was it? There was, oh man, there was something I wanted to say, but I lost it. Let's continue. <laughs> Ignore me. You'll come, you'll come to it later. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I mean, the, the, and again, the, the whole idea that like, of course this kid was somebody important. Like, of course, Yangsheng was doing this on purpose for a reason and it wasn't a good reason. Like, I, 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 Lawrence, he is just very, very dense in this book. Like even more so than in the first one. Like the, the assassination plot thing, is, 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 is he getting dumber as time goes on? I'm just very like, what is going, what happened to Karen? Like well, we're learning more about him, but I'm not really sure he's growing because like ignoring obvious assassination attempts and like somehow just be like, oh yeah, the prince is bringing a kid here for funsies. Like, well, ugh, come on. I will give Lawrence credit here. Lawrence absolutely did not think that. Lawrence was the one who was like, hey, this is suspicious. And then asshole diplomat Arthur Hammond was like, ah, oh, no, stop being it paranoid asshole i'm pretty sure this whole book was just hammond like like just just gaslighting lawrence out of his intelligence yeah, and right skills. Yes, like that's that. really what i think it was because like every single time lawrence was like hey like i have this concern hammond was like either shut up ignore it or deal with it or it's not real and i'm like so in Lawrence's defense, he was he was like there with most stuff, and then Hammond was like, "Dude," and Lawrence was like, "I'm sorry, I'm dumb." Bye. Yeah, and this this might be part of the part of the problem here again. Might be the fact that I read this book in March, so it's been yeah, a while. It's been it's been at least two months. Lawrence um, definitely like spotted these things, but Hammond would swoop in and either be like, "Hey, you can't make a deal out of this," or be well, like, then "Lawrence is so you- gullible as fuck for just like." Oh, kind yeah. of going along with it. I mean, and, but then in the end, Hammond turns out like he like fights with them in their little like weird it's, battle. I mean, in the the thing about Hammond is that I very much hated him because he was very much not letting Lawrence like make his own decisions. But like when it comes down to it, Hammond was really trying to do what was best for everyone, and unfortunately, a part of that really meant like setting aside Lawrence's own personal interests in the interest of trying to get more out of it at the end and i think it makes a lot of sense why hammond did everything he did but i also like don't really like him up until the end where he did fight with them but also like he fought with them because he was also going to die there so like not really sure if i want to give him points for that the one thing i will give him points for though is being it's like actually running with like the having the emperor adopt lawrence plan but also you know not really giving points to him for that because like he's the diplomat it's his job and yeah i think so much of what Hammond did could have been better if he would have just taken Lawrence into his 
confidence a little bit and been like, hey man, like I know that this is what you're thinking, but this is my reasoning behind it. This is what my end goal is. We are on the same page here, but I need to go about things a different way so that China doesn't hate us. Whereas you can just sort of YOLO swag your way through this and nobody's gonna care because you're an idiot. And I think like since that communication didn't happen that like they were always on different pages and it was always conflict between them and it makes sense for a fun story but as far as like interpersonal relations like Hammond my man diplomacy is both sides of the equation you need to be diplomatic with your own people too man buddy my pal and I remembered the thing that I wanted to say which was I had a really sad thought about Prince Yangxing which was maybe when he was young a part of why he decided to take Leanne was because he did feel sorry for her and also because he didn't think he wanted the throne. But then as he grew up, he just became sad and disillusioned and power hungry. And here he is now. Well, I mean, here's the thing, though. He's not actually trying to take the throne for himself, per se. No, he wants to rule as regent. Yeah. yeah. For all but, intents and purposes, he is taking the throne. And, 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 then once for... he, and then he'd probably kill the kid. Yeah. You think so? See, I, what I, I, I and, and you could be right. Like, I'm, I'm not disagreeing. Um, I, I guess, like, I kind of pictured it as, like, for sure, he was going to rule as regent, but for how long? You know, like, because in China, they come to, they come to age, like, and, and are able to rule. I think a lot younger, like, than in Britain, it was what, like, sixteen or something. I mean, um, and I feel like I China was like thirteen, but. Uh, I don't think any of that really matters, though, because when you look at it as like sort of like the equation for a bad guy, anytime a character wants to rule as regent, they're basically doing it for their own power. Like, you know, think about think about it in terms of Cersei. Like, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess I got less of that from Yang Sheng and more of yeah. I'm he thought he was more competent. Like and and He's and fun. like like he he didn't he didn't like like the policies and whatnot of um of the the prince who was going to rule yeah, I mean, and. Uh, yeah, and 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 again, like here's the thing: like we don't really know enough about what is going on in China and the policies that are happening to necessarily say like that one of them is that one of them had a better, you know, idea of of what was best for China than the other. Um, we do know that at the end of this book, they have uh, agreed to open up more trade with oh, wait, Britain. Actually, no, we do know that Yangsheng is kind of an asshole because he was very anti-West. His whole group is very anti-association with the West. They're all very keep China inside China, talk to no one, we're the best. I mean, and in some ways that's wrong, but in other ways, like, I, I well, I guess I'm looking at this as like a hindsight 2020 thing where it's like, oh, no, no, as, as everything that happens is, after China opened itself up a little more. To, probably brown person who is incredibly anti-colonialist and everything. I get that. Do not trust the white man. In the words of Pocahontas's dad, those white men are dangerous, but also like, that's not good policy to talk to people. Right. Generally. I'm yeah. Like, I, I feel like there's a lot here and it's like, I don't know. Uh, I haven't really, I don't want to look too far ahead in the series. I mean, we have seven books left. I've read through the third one in which they like do actually leave China. I will at least say that, um, you know, they, they, they move on, you know, they, they have left China in the third book. So like, I don't know if they go back eventually. Um, you know, so, so it's like, if this is the last, I, I would hope that they do, or maybe not even hope. Like, I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's a lot. <laughs> I'm not really sure what I want here because like, I know what happened historically and it's very, very sad. So knowing that, knowing that this is like the alternate, you know, alternative history uh, version of like how China first started, like, opening up um to the british is just although i did like how all this time like they were so worried that the french like had their foot in the door and it turns out that the french ambassador uh what is it, what's his name Gigan, something like that it starts with a g uh the, it turns out this whole time yeah it turns out this whole time that he's just been stuck like in this island and not allowed to leave like and he's even when they get there this guy's acting like he's like all important and like you know has been able to do whatever he wants and like they're like yeah but, no that's not how it is at all <laughs> but but that's why hong kong and 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 macau were set up is because the the westerners weren't allowed into except for right right right, right. We're not allowed into China. 
Right. No, no, no. I understand that. But I just like in, in this, like in this world, it was, you know, it was, this, it this was funny or... because they thought that like the French had like a secret in and yeah, it turns yeah. out they like super did yeah. and were like in the same boat as everybody else. And they yeah. were chosen out of luck because they were like, oh gosh, too many dragons. Eat one. But we still don't know the real reason why they were giving Napoleon the dragon. No, but oh, that, yeah, was no, no. that was it. That was it. Yeah. It was, um, it was kind of br like, like brushed over real quick, but what it was, was that because Temeraire is a celestial and there, there, there are so few of them, but there were still one, like he was going to be one too many. So if he ended up with one of the other people who was like at some point in line for the throne, it could cause. No. So the, the, the hard and fast rule is that there are only two celestials that are in possession or have companions that are the royal family. One is the emperor and the next is the emperor's heir. Yeah. And the fact that there are currently three is because Lian is albino and unlucky. So Yong Xing gave up his right to the throne by taking Lian and put himself out of the succession line. Now the problem, the so the second prince, Mian Ning, has Temerer's twin egg. Um, and so right. if now there is a third dragon, that twin egg, that whoever has that dragon will call into question if Mian Ning is the heir. But Pian, but since Mian Ning is the heir, Temerer's egg had to go somewhere else. And so, Got it. Okay. Yeah. And so that's why they were like, ah, Napoleon, give it to Napoleon. And that's why when it eventually came down to it, they were like, Lawrence can't have the egg because Lawrence is not an emperor. But then by making him part of the royal family, they sort of like bypass that and it also calls yeah but then is it now by being part of the royal family doesn't he now a threat to the throne no, he's, not chinese. No. he's not yeah. chinese doesn't yeah. doesn't matter he's a white that's man. never stuck look the british the the british royal family is not english either yeah no no that's never stopped the british Br but the british <laughs> but this is this is china's thinking and they're like yeah no nobody's ever gonna accept this white man which they won't because the rest of them have the entire celestial family to be like bitch no yeah, I also don't think Lawrence would ever. He'd be like, "Yeah, no, I don't, I don't want this." But hey, I mean, honestly, for all we know, that's the plot of a later book. Everybody has died, and they're Last like, "Ah, what about emperor. the guy that? What about the guy that emperor like like honored with a, like by by like kind of adopting him or whatever?" Like all Last those years, going to be emperor of China, Lawrence. There we go. Oh God, please no, no, no. the emperor of China, Temeraire. Yeah, there you go, there you go. That I can, that I can get behind. I will get behind that. Um, so, okay. So like, just because we're, we're at, you know, about 50 minutes, I wanted to make sure we touched on Temeraire, uh, at the end, he's all like, Maximus and Lily are smart enough to read and write. Let's go home and teach them and like make their lives better. Like, I like it. Then of course, Lawrence is like, he's going to try to help, but like, he's also so frustrating and dislikable. Like even as he's agreeing to do so, he's like, I mean like, yeah, sure. Tupper, I'm going to try. But like in his head, he's like, yeah, this is never going to happen. Like I'm, I don't, I feel like he's not really, he's just saying he's going to try, but he's, he's hoping like he can doing convince. That thing that parents do to toddlers with a toddler is like, I have this idea. They're like, yeah, sure, sweetie, go ahead. You got this buddy. I mean, not even, not even just toddlers, like, like, like when your kid is in high school and they're, they're like the star of all their little, like 3000 person high school, like 3000 student high schools, like theater productions. And they're like, I'm going to go be a movie star. And the parents are like, Pat, Pat, please get a real college degree. <laughs> that Lawrence. We, we, we had a child actress in our class. Well, not in my class, two years below us. And she was always leaving to do acting jobs. I mean, it, I, like it happens. Like Dean's Dean's oldest kid uh, was in like, like they brought him to a bunch of like auditions and he had an agent and he was in a bunch of commercials and stuff like that. But like the good thing about them, like about Dean was that he, he told his oldest like if you ever don't want to do this anymore if you're ever tired of it or bored with it or you just don't think it's for you you just let us know so at some point his kid was like yeah no uh this is boring i'm tired of going to auditions and like i get like one you know commercial every like 20 auditions that i go to and they were like okay uh i mean the good thing is it got the kid a good nest egg for you know college or whatever uh because apparently commercials pay way more than you think they do but uh but yeah i mean like like it's it's there, there's that like realistic like 
I mean, that that's like a best case scenario. You know what I mean? Like the the I, I mean, I was in high school with with people who thought they were going to be something. And some of them had a lot of talent, but so do a lot of other kids. And also, like, let's be real. Uh, Hollywood is a whole lot of luck. Of, it's 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 like, no, it is like, it is like all... one it is one third luck, one third. You better hope your parents are super freaking rich. I mean, think about it. Like 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 the pop Life isn't like, about pop talent; it's about networking. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and money. Like you you could have you could have a lot of talent and not really know anybody, Taylor Swift, but also have a fuck ton of money, Taylor Swift. Like, and you're going to be famous because of, I mean, you're not necessarily well, definitely going to be famous. Taylor Swift's family was well off. They weren't super wealthy. I mean, they were. Uh, they were pretty well. Weren't they? I, I got the impression they were like working class positions. No, no. And when I say working class, I'm not, I'm not saying not the like musicians who were playing the, like just the eat the local bars. I was like, they're professional musicians writing for the big the big names, but they weren't big names themselves. So they were had solid salaries and everything, but not super wealthy. Yeah, but that's also, they had the foot in the door. Right, yeah. that's the foot so in the like, door aspect, yeah. It's like, um, yeah, it's one or the other. You have really. to be rich, but you have to have the networking. And if you have the networking and you also have, and, and it's also like, you don't have to be rich, but you have to be solidly middle class. To be able I to, would, get, I would say out. upper middle class upper or middle like class, lower yeah. upper class. But I would say upper, very upper middle class or lower upper class at least. Like, because like my family growing up was solidly middle. Like we were lower middle class when I was young, and then like then when I was like in middle school, we were like solid middle class, and then when I was in high school, we were like upper middle class. And like that still doesn't that didn't help me at all. Other than in terms of like it's not gonna like help make me famous. Like, but it did help me be able to go to college and not have a you know between my parents and like scholarships like not have a whole bunch of debt. Um, but yeah, anyway, so so that's kind of besides the point. But like, uh, and there's Taylor Swift confirmed. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, but so I, I do. I just do love that he at the end of this is just like just by Lawrence being Lawrence. Yeah, he he just. But not just a revolution. I mean, he also he just wants to go home and like make life better for like his friends. You know, like he's like I learned these things and I love these things. Now I'll be honest. Do I really think like Maximus is going to be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to learn how to read and write. Nah, probably not. But like. Maximus probably won't give a shit. Lily's going to be like, heck yeah, reading. And then. Yeah. The board. yeah. And then Maximus yeah. might end up wanting to learn because he's like, now Timber and Lily are going to think I'm stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Am I picturing Maximus as like the kind football bro? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Maximus is the good bean football bro. Lily is like their really, really tall basketball friend who's also like just like uh, like soft. And then and then Temeraire is like the nerdy kid with glasses who runs in and he's like, my friends! And they're like, ah, oh, yes. Oh, and side note, people died in this book. Like people that we, that are part of Temeraire's like flight crew and stuff. Like, and I'm trying to like, but it's like- I truly really cannot remember who they were. I think the Which doc did the did the physician guy die? No. Or was he no. just badly injured? No, he injured. was just wounded. Okay. He was and he's fine now. Pretty sure the only ones that are alive now are the kids in Granby and then a couple others. I don't the know. Only, yeah. yeah, but even those, we barely knew their names. I mean, that's one of my problems with this series is the secondary and tertiary characters really are quadruciary and <laughs> lower down. The totem yeah. pole, yeah, for importance. Yeah, there are the primary characters, and then there's everybody else. But everybody else is like in the core of the earth because we don't care. Yeah, I. I they may as well I, all be red shirts for all intents and purposes. Yeah, I, I have a hard time remembering any of them other than Granby and Emily. So, yep, those are the only ones that matter: Granby and Emily. And, and I must admit, I I wonder why. This is compared to like Game of Thrones using that as the example because there's so many characters, and it seems like those characters, at least to me, were memorable, even though they were just throwaway characters. But these don't seem memorable to me in any way at all. 
Um, I think a big part of that is uh, the style that the stories are told in. Um, like this, this you know, the, these books are, they're Lawrence POV. You know what I mean? Um, whereas Game of Thrones, we, or Song of Ice and Fire, we get so many different POVs that like a lot of times you see uh, the the bit characters like Jory Cassell, for instance, you see him from uh, Catelyn's, Ned's, and Sansa's, and possibly, and I think Arya's point of views. And I think um, Jamie's also. Uh, no, no, because um, Jamie isn't a POV character at that point. I know, but didn't Jamie mention him? He might he might have mentioned him later, but I think like I bet that's the thing though, like that's like in Sor Storm of Swords, like not to get off the top off topic yeah. and go into Song of Ice and Fire, but like I think that that is the difference is that with Lawrence, like, and he is so especially focused on Temeraire that. And I think he's extra focused on Emily because she's the only girl in his crew and also right. because of his relationship with her mother. Um, and I think he's very, I mean, he's obviously very focused on Granby because Granby is his second in command, essentially. Right. So he um, also had that conflict in the first book, which is the only thing we know about Granby. And tr in truth, if he had picked any other second in command, I doubt we would have known about them as well. And the mm -hmm. only reason we know about Granby is because they had that conflict. Yeah. Yeah, which was actually a, kind of a good piece of of writing and character development on Naomi Novik's part. Um, I love Granby actually. Like he's one of the few yeah, characters no, that like, if he died, I would notice and I would be sad. Yeah, <laughs> no, 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 I, I mean, I agree. Like he's, he's horrible because he. And the thing is, like, he was never actually bad. Like their conflict was entirely like uh, a misunderstanding. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It was, and it and was the comedy of circumstances. Yeah. Um. All right. Well, uh, before we wrap up, any last thoughts on? Oh, did I lose my internet? Um, you're like wiggling. Yeah, there's yeah my there's my internet like my little my little Wi-Fi thing is like very low right now. <laughs> so you're both just doing the thing where it was like, and oh, there is going to be okay. It just yeah, it just got better. Honestly, it could be now. that it could it could be that the kid is playing. Uh, whatever streaming game he's playing. Streaming something, yeah. Ooh, gotta um, the past. Gotta get <laughs> the internet. Sharing the bandwidth with three other people is something I have not been used to ever. Oh, yeah, no, it's really bad. <laughs> Especially yeah. when my mom and dad work from home. And then, no, that's not great. But anyway, okay. So, so um, before we wrap up, uh, any like any last thoughts? Like, have you have either of you guys moved on to book three yet? I just started it. I'm probably a chapter into it. Two, I, maybe two chapters in. I downloaded the audiobook. Actually, more than two, maybe. now that I think about it, but not far. I, I have the audiobook now. Um, I also, I realized that, like, these books are a lot easier for me to do by audio. So much. Uh, yeah, I can understand that. Yeah. Um. So, so yeah, I, I mean, I... I, I I will say, like as I said with the last one, um, the, the third book has some slow bits. They're weirdly enough, they're more toward like the last like third of the book versus like the first part. But um, I, I do like. I think this at times, uh, Naomi Novik is maybe taking a little bit too long to tell the story in in some ways, which is again, I think you know part of the issue with the first half of Third of Jade, but. Um, I, 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 I am very interested to see where things go from here yeah. just because I, I, I want to believe that Lawrence is going to be less boring at some point. And I, uh, I'm just very intrigued at Temeraire being the little I revolution. Personally, I personally have no hopes for Lawrence being more interesting, but I am very intrigued to see what Novik uses this story like as a platform to like discuss societal like issues and problems that she sees because like she has been doing that very effectively through Temeraire so far and I'm curious to see if she's going to continue to do more on a very surface level as Temeraire has been doing or if we're going to dive deeper into these issues and very excited for that and I can also say that this book was great because it served to make me a thousandfold more interested mm -hmm. and invested in this series than I was because mm -hmm. As of two weeks ago, if you'd asked me if I was looking forward to reading the rest of the series, I would have been like, hell's God, no, I'm going to die for them. But now I'm like, now I'm here. Now I'm on board. I'm ready. Let's go. 
Yeah, no, it's, 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 I mean, I wasn't like, I didn't hate the first book, but it was like, oh gosh, there are nine of these. I, I didn't hate the first book, but I'm also, I'm at that point in my life where I now know that like, there's no way I'm going to be able to finish every book that I want to read. And I've actively started writing down my interest in books that I want to read. So I'm like, you know what, if something doesn't grasp me, there's no reason for me to stick with it. And this was one of those books that like, if it wasn't for this book webcast, I wouldn't have stuck with it. And I feel like I might've missed out. Because Throne of Jade has me now tentatively excited for the rest of the series. And I am interested to see what's going to happen. Also because yeah. I really end up loving Spinning Silver. So clearly yeah, I do. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I've been at the point many for years that unless forced to read a book, if if a book doesn't have me in 30 pages, I'm out. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Dang, I don't that's just not it. worth it. I don't know I'm, if I can ever be that like harsh with it, but that's a that's a goddamn good rule. Yeah, that 30 pages is very few. For for me, it's it's I'm more like that with TV shows. Like if if a show doesn't hook me in three episodes, I there there's like if I'm like less than 30% interested, I'll quit after three episodes. If I'm slightly more than that, I will watch the fourth and quit after the fourth if it hasn't helped at all. But like books, those are one of those things. I have there are two books in my life that I have not finished. Uh Les Mis and uh, Man in the Iron Mask. Yeah, I have um, officially so, uh, DNF'd two books in the last year. But yeah, proud of myself for actually doing it. I probably yeah. have 70 books on my Kindle I haven't finished. Nice. I got to give myself <laughs> permission to do this more. Uh, I wish I, like, I, I mean, that's the thing though. Like there's, there's books like, it's like the Silmarillion. It took me literally years to finish the Silmarillion. And I only did it because I was like, I started this. I really love like Lord of the Rings. Like I can't not finish it. Um, and, but I and think there's also a difference between like slogging through something that is dry because it is part of a greater fandom that you care about. For me, that's like how true. it's probably going to be with Fire and Blood because I've had it forever and I just haven't read it yet. But like, I love Game of Thrones and I want to know this Targaryen lore, so I'm gonna read Fire and Blood eventually. But like, yeah, I I, I flew through that. I didn't think that was difficult reading. <laughs> it is. It is the type of book that could be construed as difficult. Is what I mean. Uh, uh, I'll say I'll this probably love it like you did, Jonathan. But like it's I'll, yeah, that's it's one of those things say. that like if somebody gave me a fire and blood type of book, but it was for a series I wasn't invested in, I probably wouldn't read it. Like if that was just like the first book, and they were like, read this, and then read like seven more of this, I would have been like, hell no, like I don't wanna. You know? And yeah, and I think that's kind of the lesson here about this series is like the first book may be a bit slow for you, but maybe like finish it and give give book two a chance. I feel like if you don't like Throne of Jade, then you're probably not going to like the rest of the mm -hmm. series is my guess. But uh, and and also, again, like, unfortunately, you do have to slog through like the sea voyage stuff in, in Throne of Jade. Probably, I mean, maybe not everybody feels that way about the sea voyage stuff, but I felt like it was a slog. Uh, but I was like so glad that I like pushed I, I felt like I was drowning in it. Ah, ah, but um, <laughs> uh, but I'm glad I did because in the end it was it was uh the second half of this book more than makes up for the first half and like I I I I'm I can tell you that the third book there there's there's slow parts in the third book but it's a lot like of a it's a lot smaller of a portion of the book and it's also at the tail end for the most part. So it's, it's, it, it makes that a little bit more palatable too. Cause you've got a lot of great stuff leading up to the little bit that slogs. Um, and it's, it's not, it's not even as slow as like this, but, uh, I'm hoping that in the future, like installments in this series, like that, that's kind of how it, like, that's how the, the pattern continues that the parts that are slow get like shorter and shorter and less important. <laughs> Uh, but generally, yeah, I, I, I think this is a series that I'm glad that I was doing this webcast for, because otherwise I probably wouldn't have gotten past the first book. And I think that's, I think it says a lot that at least the two of us are in that, Nami and I are in that. And then Jonathan, I guess, I don't know about you. Would you have, if it weren't for this webcast, would you have read Throne of Jade? Well, I'll be honest. I've, I had the first book in, on my Kindle for years and I, didn't get into it in 30 pages and was out. <laughs> we have forced you peer pressure. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> I mean, so, I mean, it, you know, I, I, it's okay. I mean, I, I, there are certain books that I decide as in my life. Okay. I've read it. I'm interested enough to continue reading it. 
but I'm not going to remember 30 years from now, I'll, I'll remember I read it, nothing else. And I fear that this might be one of those types of series. It's entertaining as I read it, but it's not gripping me so much that I'm like, I have to finish this. I think, I think it's going to, Oh yeah, no, I, that's certainly part of it. Um, I, and I, I do, but I do think that like Nami said, if, if the themes of like, Temerir just being this like revolutionary continue. I I feel like the conflict then it will get more, more fun, right? Yeah, I feel like the conflicts are going to be a lot like hit a lot closer to home and stuff like that. So, all right. Well, on that note, uh, we will be back actually in since we had to delay uh, this particular webcast episode. Um, we'll be back in about a week and a half on Wednesday, June 9th to cover. Black Powder War. I, I am really bad at remembering the next season. I was like, thank God I have them right behind me. Uh, so we'll be back on June 9th to cover Black Powder War, um, which I hope you guys enjoy because I, I, it's it is missing some of the fun stuff like that we saw in China, but it it opens a lot more of the world to us, uh, to to say the least. So I I, I think. I think it'll be pretty enjoyable for everybody. But yeah, so we'll see everybody back on June 9th. Once again, I'm Tara along with Jonathan and Nami. And thank you for joining us for Sogs and Sass. And we'll see you next time. Good night. Bye.